Good morning, Mr. Phelps. This podcast, should you decide to listen to it, is the fourth edition of the Carnival of Randomness, your antidote for nerd culture and weekly inoculation of reality. Today, we are coming to you live from the Mockingbird Lane Studios at 666 and a half, which is the apartment above the Beast's Garage. You are joined today by myself, Zach, and the lovely Rob. Hello. There you go. And today, folks, we're going to be talking about classic TV shows. Um, please don't let the lack of visual make you not think that I'm not doing air quotes for classic, because some of them are classic but for a different reason. And speaking of that, I'm going to launch right into everybody's favorite Canadian science fiction show, Lex. Not Lex Luger the Wrestler? Yes, Lex with two X's. It actually ran for four seasons from 1997 to 2002. The basic premise of it was, was it rather, it was rather kind of farscapey with the ship is an actual living organic being and the rather bumbling crew is attached to the ship and flies through space, running from enemies and getting into various misadventures. But randomly, especially for being a rather low-budget Canadian show, it did have some interesting people that popped in from time to time. I know Tim Curry was in an episode, Barry Bostwick was in an episode, and one of the main villains who gets my vote for greatest name in the universe was a man named Dieter Laser. That is his actual name, and if you don't know who that is, he later came to quote-unquote fame in the Human Centipede movies as the evil scientist. That old creepy guy, the real, real thin one, that was Dieter Laser. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, so that was him. All in all, I mean, I picked the show up relatively cheap. It's goofy as all hell, but it's entertaining, and that's what you want, because it, unlike all of the other science fiction shows where... Everyone in the crew is a strapping, you know, person with great morals and things like that. This guy was a janitor, and that's it. And he somehow stumbled into this command post when they were, I think, going to execute him, if if I remember correctly. I want to reiterate that we're not experts. Anybody can be an expert online these days. I mean, you can talk sports, music. You can be a critic. I think that's make work a lot of times. And a lot of these people who claim to be experts, you should really call the police on them. And speaking of police, my first show goes back to the early 60s. It's Car 54, Where Are You? And bear with us, please. We're going to try to say or maybe sort of sing the uh, theme song. Oh, the Car 54 song, was it? There's a holdup in the Bronx. Brooklyn's broken out in fights. There's a traffic jam to Harlem. Traffic jam in Harlem that's backed up to Jackson Heights. There's a scout troop short a child. Khrushchev is an idle wild. Car, Car 54, 54, where are you? Where are you? This follows the adventures of the 49th Precinct, actually, in the car named in the show. And the officers are Francis Muldoon, played by Fred Gwynn, who is quite the erudite sort, and Gunther Tootie, played by Joey Ross, who I believe is also in another show I'm going to talk about, who basically says, ooh, 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 a lot. Well, uh, don't forget also you have, uh, at the time of the show, please, please, for the love of God, this is going to be the first in the we watched it so you don't have to things don't watch the movie remake yeah uh al lewis before the monsters was with fred gwynn he was officer leo schnauzer who basically complains all the time that he has bad luck and look for a young nipsey russell is uh the uh call phone operator and basically it's really lighthearted. it's not really a lot of them doing capers really uh, Tootie and Muldoon are inept, but in their ineptitude, they do well because the people in their district love them so much, they enforce the laws. And they do a lot of the things that uh, Tootie goes on a lot about, fights with his wife, she fights with Schauser all the time. They do a lot of schemes that don't work. It's just fun. Check it out. It's often on Nick at Night. Um, and I know you said sports earlier, and at the, the time of this airing, football season is right around the corner, so I'm going to crack out a little gem from HBO's history. First and ten. A uh, six-season little trinket of television deliciousness from 84 to 91, so you're talking the golden age of, well, TV shows. Uh, who was the big one? O.J. Simpson was in it. I know that. That's uh, why it's worth under $20 at Walmart if you look for it. I actually got mine elsewhere. I got the complete series. I think it was 10 bucks. But in any event... Uh, Delta Burke was at one point the owner, and it was kind of Slapshot-esque. There was a bunch of different owners for this 
ragtag football team. Was it the Bulls? I, I think, think it was the I think it was the Bulls. I can't recall. Internet I'm sure the internet will let us know. Um who else? oh, John Matuzak was in it. And John Matuzak, for those of you who don't know, sadly passed away in the late nineteen eighties, uh gained great fame as uh God, what was the his twos, name? The twos, the twos. He's a wild man. Even Ken Stabler said when he roomed with them that he was out of control. I just totally blanked on his name, but I remember he was Sloth from the Goonies. Same oh, guy. Oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Yeah, that was the twos, but a great football player. Sadly died, I think, way, way, way too young. But that, I think that was one of the predecessors of the goofy sports shows. And I don't think there really were too many goofy sports shows because after... After that, it really became like the Friday Night Lights and more serious sporting shows. But there wasn't too many that were just lighthearted. Well, I know there was a TV adaptation of the Bad News Bears. Kind of stunk. Oh, God, was there? I don't even remember That's that. why it was gone really soon. It was not good. I mean, I remember the original movie with Walter Matthau and then the subsequent movie with Billy Bob Thornton, which wasn't as terrible, but never knew they made a TV adaptation. And speaking of that, let's go off kilter here a minute. What is it with the television adaption of movies that really never seem to work out? Hmm. I mean, there has been some great ones. Uh, what were we talking about early in the part? Oh, the Ghostbusters. The Ghostbusters show. That was... I, I honestly don't even remember that too much. No, that one had Long Dong Tucker and Larry Storch. was almost uh, the cast from F Troop. And what happened when they did the movie is... Look, the people from the show were, hey, we have the name for this. So what they did was they got them a cartoon show called the original Ghostbusters. And it had Bob Burns, who's very big into uh, archival work and different things with sci-fi and horror, as uh, Tracy the Gorilla. I was going to say, that's right, there was a gorilla yeah, in Kong something. was actually Forrest Tucker. It wasn't the gorilla. And they had the ghostly dematerializer. Oh, Lord. I don't know why I've never watched that. Uh, for a while, they only had 15 episodes, five were lost, and they finally got it together. And if you watch it, uh, better to talk about it. Well, and on the short-lived cop shows, let's talk about something that I have enjoyed. The wonderful Police Squad. Six episodes in the entirety of its run. And there was the infamous uh, beginning when they always would murder some random celebrity. And I think one of the episodes, it was supposed to be John Belushi. But they pulled it because he had actually died. I can't remember who they replaced it with. But that was the show that spawned the Naked Gun franchise. Because the original movie was the Naked Gun from the Files of Police Squad. And it was essentially what the Naked Gun movies were. It was six episodes of just campy, spoofy cop stuff with... The late, great Leslie Nielsen, the late, great... Was George Kennedy in the show as well? I don't think he was. It's been a long time, but Leslie Nielsen just had the knack of playing it really straight. And then O.J. Simpson, again, we're throwing back to him. He came in in the uh, the movies. Nordberg. Yeah, as Nordberg. I can't remember who Nordberg was in the TV show. Adam West actually said he would have been great in those kind of movies because of what he did with Batman, that he could have done the deadpan really well. He probably could have. I think he could have. And I know you mentioned F Troop earlier, and I want to talk about F Troop because F Troop was hilarious. Back in mid-60s, 65 to 67, it was a, what, Civil War era? Would yeah. you say or Post-Civil War era. Probably Grant presidency a little later around there. Yeah, of the... Oh, God, what was the fort's name? I just blanked. I don't remember. Uh, they had a... Name. Anyways, we'll think of it at some point. This is how we work. It was the Hawakawi tribe. Yeah, the Hawakawi tribe as the great Frank Decova, the Italian Native American actor. He said, what is it? We fall off cliff. We wake up, look around and go, where the heck are we? And there's a little trivia in terms of uh, Major Palmiter and his courtship. Yes, uh, Major Palmiter, Captain Barry. Captain Palmiter, played by Ken Barry, who was also in Mama's Family, and was it Wrangler Jane, who was played by a girl named Melody Patterson. In the first series, she is intended to be his love interest, but he's very standoffish towards her, because during the time of the first season, she was 16 years old, turning 17. And the producers at the time didn't know that, so to prevent anything unseemly from happening, they had him be very, very, you know, oh, no, 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 
you know, no, can't do that, can't do that. You know, every time she would try to kiss him, he would run away. But then in the second season, as she turned 18, you could see that their relationship had definitely become closer. And wanted to stay after Troop and not become the lead of the series. Well, and also because what did he, he was famous for saying, we pommenters have very long engagements. And very, very long marriages. In very, very long marriages. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pull one out of my hat right now. Bill Bixby has been around for how many series is over the years? Probably think at least four. He's directed a lot. But there was one in the 1970s called The Magician. And this was one. It only ran for a year, even though I guess it had a pretty good popularity. And what it is is he was a magician in it, and he solved murder cases. And so he would use his skills there of conjuring for deduction to solve the cases. One of the interesting things about this was, I guess, Bill Bixby really practiced magic. He was a member of a lot of association of magicians, so there was a lot of uh, credibility when he did it. And unfortunately, it didn't last long, and he got very angry, and you wouldn't want to make him angry. And he went on to do something there with a green-skinned fellow. Really? You had to pull that reference out? The You don't want to make him angry? Why? Because he'd make you disappear? (laughs) <laughs> in more than one way. Well, the show disappeared after a year, so... <laughs> well, that's the thing. And a lot of these shows, they didn't have very long runs. Although, granted, F Troop, it lasted two seasons, but it was 65 episodes because that was back in the day of one season of a TV show would have been between 30 and 50 episodes. A la, what, Adam's Family was two seasons, but I think in the 80s for episodes. The Monsters was two seasons, 70 episodes. Exactly. But let's, let's talk about... Uh, some short-lived shows, and one that's not on my list, but I was speaking with a friend about it last night, is a show called Cleopatra 2525. Have you ever even heard of this one? Uh, are you asking me that? Yeah. I'm, oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't, actually. Well, I hadn't either. It was a show that uh, one of my dear friends watched when she was um, in her younger days. It was a one-season show. I think in 1994, if I remember correctly, one of the big stars was Gina Torres of later Firefly fame. And it was in the same era of Xena, Hercules, so all these cast members kind of crossed over. I never watched it, but the gist of it was the character who experiences complications, and I'm not making this up, from her breast augmentation surgery is put into a medically induced coma, awakens 500 years, or 525 years later, and her name is Cleo, or Cleopatra. And then there, oh, the the enemy were these flying machines called the Baileys. And there was, they were taking their orders from The Voice. It was a voice that came through an implant in one of the squad leader's heads. I'm not making this up. This was sure? actually <laughs> This was actually a thing. Come on. Doesn't that not sound interesting? I'm going to have to look that one up because yeah. I've heard of Cleopatra Jones, the movie, but this... Uh... Oh, no. Cleopatra 2525. It was a thing. I don't know if you ever spoke to Gina Torres about it, if she would acknowledge it, but it was a thing. So have that little chunk, Internet. Uh, I'm going to go back to the 70s classic police show and Who Loves You, Baby? Uh, recently, I watched the whole uh, run of Kojak, and this is a story about... Telly Savalas, who's been an actor for forever, you've seen in a lot of movies, including the great movie The Horror Express. And he plays Lieutenant Theo Kojic in a Manhattan precinct. And he goes around uh, solving cases with his bunch of guys. And there's a presence to him. I mean, he's got, you can tell, he's got a gravitas where it, he's done a lot of movies and everything. And he just brings it to the screen. He's always in charge. He's got a sense of humor. But there's a few misnomers. He starts smoking cigarellos. Then he develops the lollipop fetish, so I don't know if he quit smoking or somebody complained. But the big saying on the show that you hear was always, who loves you, baby? It's not as bad as beam me up Scotty from Star Trek, which they never said. He says it, but most of the time he uses baby in other terms. There's one Christmas episode where he goes, love everybody, baby, but he doesn't really say who loves you, baby. And it continued on basically to his death in about eight made-for-TV movies. Well, and that's another thing. Uh, you always... Like, the Beam Me Up Scotty thing is probably one of the most famous ones that was never said, but everybody thinks was said. And I wonder where these kind of misnomers come from, because, I, like, you went through Kojak. I'm actually going through the Mission Impossible TV show because I never watched it, even when it was in syndication. And everybody always makes the assumption that it was, 
you know, you know, hence the beginning of the show. Should you choose you're this mission? Should you choose to accept it? No, that's not how it was. It was this mission. Should you decide to accept it? And the the whole this tape will self destruct in five seconds wasn't used as in every episode because. In the beginning, it took, I think, 10 or 12 episodes before the first time. Usually it was, please dispose of this recording in the usual manner. And he just happened to be near, you know, a vat of acid or an airport-grade incinerator to dispose of the tape. I think my favorite one was they were playing it on a, on a record. And for you younger audiences, go to Google and Google what a record or an LP is. He played the message on the record, and it said, this recording will self-destruct when it hits the last groove. And then it just bursts into smoke. But there's got to be some other ones. The you know, we, we think that that's what they said, but they never really did. What, do you have any more off the top no, of your I head? Can't th- I just know Leonard Nimoy joined the cast after Star Trek was over, but it would have been really amusing kind of if they had one episode. Nah, I don't want to do that mission. See you next week. Well, that's the thing, because they always said... This mission, should you decide to accept it? Why? You know, there's got to have been one when he said, no, I don't want to do this. And in terms of movies that we didn't even watch because I never made it through, but I've avoided the Tom Cruise movies like The Plague. I tried the first one, made it through 15 minutes, so stick to the series. And the one thing I heard was uh, Greg Morris, who played Barney Collier, the tech expert in the TV show, famously walked out of the first Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movie calling it, from what I understand, quote, an abomination, end quote. And Doug Ray Scott must hate that franchise because he was tapped to be Wolverine. He decided to do Mission Impossible instead. So while Hugh Jackman's doing whatever he wants, uh, Doug Ray Scott's starring in sci-fi channel movies. Oh, speaking of sci-fi channel movies, by the time this airs, ladies and gentlemen, the final portion of Sharknado. I just wanted to throw that shameless plug out there. It's called The Final Sharknado. It's about time. I know it's coming up on sci-fi pretty soon. So catch it, watch it, because that franchise is just ridiculous. But I want to go back, um, because you were talking about Kojak. What is it with cop shows? Because there's just a ton of cop shows. I know a while ago you and I were going back and forth just trying to name all the different cop shows we could. Probably easy. Probably something that everybody can relate to and produce. And I always like like some of them, for example, like Starsky and Hutch which I grew up with, uh, they could break every rule in the book, but because they're the good guys, it's okay. Well, that's what I always thought. You, mm-hmm. you, because you have these police officers who are supposed to be the law-abiding citizens that'll blow up a building to stop a purse snatcher, and it's okay. Who gets the bill for that? You know, Internet, by the way, shameless plug time, If you can answer any of these questions, or if you can weigh in on some of the cop shows, feel free to find us on Facebook, Carnival of Randomness. Give us an email, carnivalofrandomness at gmail. Look for all our stuff, and please, get involved. We want to know, are there some TV shows that you liked that we didn't cover? TV shows that you hated that we didn't cover? TV shows we covered that you hated. (laughs) Or TV shows that we covered that you now hate because of us? Please let us know. I'm going to go, actually, you mentioned Mission Impossible, so I'm going to actually do not really a sequel, but an equal in a way, because it starred real-life husband and wife team Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. This was Space 1999. Now, this was really sort of a Star Trek ripoff in a way, but what happened, it was a base on the moon, Moon Base Alpha, and there was an explosion. I think asteroids collide. The moon gets knocked out of orbit, goes sailing through the universe, and they're trying to hopefully find a way home. And they rode around in these uh, ships that looked like egg cartons. And if you watch the series, what really stands out now is how much they ripped off Star Trek. Literally, there's one episode. It's the Gorn episode again with Captain Koenig, though, this time Martin Landau instead of William Shatner. But it's interesting to watch. And there were little model eagles running around at the time. And Moonbase Alpha was there. They had a doctor, of course. Then they had they ran two seasons. They had a girl named Maya. And she could change into all kinds of creatures. So one time an indestructible monster gets on there. Where he came from, I do not know. And she turns into a fly and goes in his ear and blows out his circuits. But it's entertaining. It's fun. Look at it and say, okay, that's the Star Trek episode they took from. But Koenig and Bane are really good. The actors are really professional. That's about it. So Moon Base Alpha, is that the cousin of Moon Unit Zappa? Oh, no. Probably. Maybe Frank thought of the name because of that. 
oh my, that's something I didn't even think of. It's I never knew if there was a moon base Omega that was like the last base. But... Well, that's the thing because uh, Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. But otherwise, uh, it's, it's a very really interesting series. But I'm going to go back to something we mentioned for a moment: Starsky and Hutch. And Starsky and Hutch was a little different. It was two oddly matched partners. Uh, Hutchinson was really the John Denver granola eating, 1970s sensitive man. Starsky was the weird guy. And when David Soul auditioned, he wanted to play Starsky because he said Hutch is boring. But he ended up playing Hutch. And Starsky was the guy. Everybody wanted to be Hutch. I wanted to be Starsky, which says a lot. And the shows were more gritty than usual. There's one episode where Hutch gets addicted to heroin by these bad guys. They had a pimp, Antonio Fargus, who was Huggy Bear. I was going to say, that was Huggy Bear. And his son played for the uh, Raiders for a while in the NFL. Really? Yeah, he did. Antonio Fargus Jr., Oh, God. Or Justin Fargus, yeah, I, I think was say, his name. Yeah, yeah, I remember a Fargus. But the episodes are really entertaining. They had one, uh, Paul Michael Glazer, who played Starsky, wanted to quit after a couple of years. It was very popular, but he didn't like the violence. So it got into more the character driven. They do one where they go on vacation and they fight Satanists, which sounds like a little bit of a ripoff of the movie Race with the Devil. And it's. A good show, though, because, and again, you wonder, they have a guy, their captain, Captain Doby, who I forget who was played by, very bombastic, it was like Captain Lou Albano, almost directing a police academy, and he would yell at them all the time, but he'd go, Huggy Bear, you know, you guys have Huggy Bear there. Well, Huggy's not a monster, yeah, but he's, I don't know what he's doing, and Snoop Dogg played him in the movie, so that's sort of like what the character was about. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Well... I, I think because you were mentioning the violence and all that and the grittiness. Let's talk about the A-Team real quick. Because have you ever seen a more violent show where nobody died? I mean, you can fire 10,000 rounds of ammunition, 2,500 rockets at a van, explosions everywhere, plants are exploding, and everybody gets up and dusts themselves off. How is that possible? Everybody used to say, oh, it's so violent and so so dangerous. But no, nobody, I don't, in all the episodes I ever saw, granted I never saw the whole series, I don't recall anybody ever actually dying in all that All I show. remember is one episode, B.A. Baracus, who was played by Mr. T, who was the fed at the moment of the time. I pity the fool who says he was a fed. But was he a pacifist? Because in the movie... No, Terry, he was. He, he very much was. But they hypnotize him, so when he hears the move, the word eclipse... He falls asleep. So there's one gun battle. One of the guys, and Dirk Benedict was in it, who played Starbuck in Battlestar Galactica. And he says, pass me the clips. Sounds like Eclipse. He dozes out during the thing. And I guess the crew and cast got along very badly. And as you watch the later seasons, you can almost tell. And the big star was George Papard. Yeah, who was Hannibal? Yeah, uh, Hannibal. Was it Hannibal? Hannibal Smith was lost. Hannibal in Smith. Space. No. That was lost in space. Hannibal something. Internet, help us out. I can't remember. It was, it was played Hannibal by something. Liam Neeson in the movie, which isn't as bad as you would no, think. No, I actually enjoyed the movie. I, and uh, good shout out to the acting chops of Quentin Rampage Jackson for filling in the B.A. Baracus role. I thought he did, he did a great job. And Liam Neeson is Liam Neeson. And I'm checking the rafters and making sure he's not coming down through it for us. But also on that note, in uh, the, back to Mission Impossible real quick. The one thing I noticed, and it's only been two seasons so far... Any time a character gets shot and dies, you never see any blood. But every time there's blood, that's the indication that they're faking their death. Because I've seen Martin Landau take a shotgun blast. Or no, it wasn't Martin Landau. It was uh, Peter Lupus. Takes a shotgun blast to the chest, falls down, covered in blood. And as soon as they close the door to the bunker that they were in, he just gets up and runs away. So I think that's the indication that... If there's blood, don't worry. They're going to be back. Because Peter Graves took a knife in the gut a few times and got up and walked it off. Wow, that's amazing. I'm going to go to one show now that's been so inspirational. It's really outlived its popularity at the time. If you like X-Files, uh, thank this show. If you don't like X-Files, we'll blame it. Kolchak the Night Stalker. Oh. And this was a show is really made by Darren McGavin, who plays Carl Kolsak with a C and with a K. And he's an intrepid reporter for a Chicago paper with his boss, Vinny Vincenzo, who's always yelling at him, played by Simon Oakland, who you'll see popping up in all kinds of movies, including The Cincinnati Kid. And McGavin was all around, too. And what happens, there's a pilot episode with a vampire that at the time 
was the highest rated TV movie there was. And then they had a sequel, The Night Strangler, with Oscar Goldman from The Six Million Dollar Man that wasn't as good. He played sort of a zombie type guy who had to pop out of his hiding place in Seattle to extract life fluid so he could stay young. And that doesn't go well. But then it went into the series, and Kolchak would always, same plot every week. There's some people getting killed, weird stuff. Nobody would believe him. Kolchak would find the truth. It would be some scary thing in the night. And in the day, it was terrifying. And when I was a kid, I would shudder. Watching it now, not you so much. You shudder, but for a different reason. Yes. Uh, there's one with uh, Richard Keel, the great Richard Keel, playing a swamp monster, Paramount Fay. And you could see the zipper on the back of his costume, which looks like moss thrown over everybody. And the problem with this show, and Darren McGavin said this himself, was it was the monster of the week. And every week it was just the same thing. And I think Millennium fell into that problem when it came out with the serial killer of the week. And after a while, it's okay, what is it? It's the same thing. He wanted to do a fugitive-type show where he's pursuing the vampire every week and just missing him. But he makes the show. And they tried doing a remake. Don't bother. Because, really, it's worth watching just for him because he's just so good in it. And these days, you think of the youth culture. You never get a guy who's in his 50s playing this lead character. But he was just incredible. And, of course, who did he turn into? The old man on the Christmas story. Bumpy says... And it's just the same thing. It's like Kolchak retired and now hates dogs. And I know he was in uh, in the in an episode of the X Files and I believe Millennium playing a Kolchak type, but not actually calling himself Kolchak. For years and years, Chris Carter tried to get him for the show, and he just didn't want to do it. And by then, he's in his seventies, probably semi-retired. And finally, they had him on these episodes, and it's almost like he's Kolchak. The secret agents finally got him. He's in retirement, but they never say he's Kolchak, but he's Kolchak. Right. Everything is leading to the fact that you know it's Kolchak, but yet they... I can't remember what his name was in the series, but he wasn't Kolchak. Um, something actually I remember watching on the lovely Nick at Night back in the day, uh, Dragnet. Anybody remember Dragnet? I only want the facts for this one. Nothing else. No funny stuff. Well, and I think that was... One of the interesting things about Dragnet is that it was kind of educational in that it explained the process. Like, at the very end, like, these criminals were tried in a court of law. They received X number of months in jail for this crime. But it was uh, the legendary Jack Webb and Harry Morgan, later of MASH fame. I think he had an earlier partner that, I think, but Google it for us, please. Who, Harry Morgan? Uh, Jack Webb oh. had somebody else before Harry Morgan, I think when it became Dragnet in 1968. I'm not sure, though, so look I, it up. I don't remember that. I just remember that Harry Morgan was the captain in the movie, which was a good movie. Sorry, right, we're not talking movies. We're talking TV shows. But it's random. We can bring them up. No, well, that's true. But I, I always remember Dragnet, and then that, that theme song is legendary. There are certain theme songs I think, bum, are, bum, bum, bum. I think are legendary. You go, uh, Dragnet. You hear it instantly, you know what it is. Peter Gunn, that's a big one. We won't talk about it here because we'll probably do BBC, but Doctor Who. Yeah, Doctor Who. Um, God, I just had one. Star Trek. Well, Star Trek. Uh, give me a minute, I got nothing. No, I, I'll Get Smart. Yeah, Get Smart was a good one, which is just a fantastic show. And in my opinion, even after 50-plus years, I think it still holds well, up. Well, talking about Get Smart, I think you missed the point by this much. I'm going to put you in the cone of silence. But, but then we'll could... still be able to hear you because the cone, that's the... And kids, if you ever want to see a perfect example of what is called the running joke, watch Get Smart and take note every time they discuss or use the cone of silence because it never works. And that is one of the perfect examples of running joke, running gag, whatever you want to call it, because it's throughout the whole series and... The, the Cone of Silence essentially becomes a character unto itself. And if you want to hear more of Don Adams, he was the voice of, who was the dog on the cartoon? Wasn't he the dog on the one cartoon, like Deputy Dog or Tennessee Tuxedo? Yeah, he was Tennessee it? Tuxedo, which was a penguin. He was also the voice of the original cartoon version, well, the American one of Inspector Gadget. Well, dog or penguin, same thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I remember him as Tennessee Tuxedo. Tennessee Tuxedo. One of the things about Dragnet, too, is Jack Webb was very conservative and took it really seriously. He really, really did. There was a movie he was in called Marine, where he's a Marine drill sergeant. He tells the guy they can go in if they shoot a male flea. They shoot the flea, looks at it, he goes... 
wrong flea, it's a female. But what happened with Dragnet is, if you watch the later episodes, it becomes unintentionally funny because he hated the counterculture. So the badly hippies, all these drugged out wacko students. I remember that it always seemed to be the 1960s flower children that were the, somehow the enemies of the state. They had the one where the woman was whacked out on LSD and microwaved her baby. That I don't remember. <laughs> you can find it, yes, and Jack Webb would always chastise them. He debates these hippies on campus one time about, while well, a police officer, if he discharges his pistol, he must count the bullets and everything, so on and so forth. And he just could not stand them in real life. So that became unintentionally over the top. It's like, you know, when you get too serious about anything, it's no fun anymore. But it was funny. Well, good Lord, I don't even remember that part of it. Watch it again. You'll see I'm going to have to watch it A lot it of the again. older episodes, like Dragnet's 1968 <laughs> was when they did it. And another thing, is because we're talking about listen, or watching these shows, visit your local library. That's where we've been getting most of these shows because they have them. That's, I think they just have the love boat on now, don't they? Oh, uh, unfortunately, that, and I want, that's going to segue into something I want to call the shows we didn't watch at the time but want to now. And actually, my number one pick is the love boat. When I was growing up, it was more in, it was in syndication at that point because I think it was a 1970s show. But I never watched it because I looked at the name, The Love Boat. I'm like, why would I want to watch that? But later it became clear to me that it was not what I thought it was, that it was kind of a, a comedy, and they had different special guest stars every week. And we're talking some big names in the 1970s. I know... Just through watching uh, some old 70s game shows, you see great names. Uh, I know Gene Rayburn, the great... Uh, Match Game. Yeah, the great uh, game show host from Match Game fame was in a couple episodes, or an episode. But the only problem is, I was looking on the library's website, and I wanted to get start getting uh, The Love Boat. They only had seasons one and two. I'm like, come on, why would you only have seasons one and two? Turns out, that's all they've released so far. They haven't released any Love Boat after season two as of yet. They have another, I think season three is scheduled for maybe later this year, or early next year. Yeah, and a little trivia for you. Uh, the yeoman, who was played by Fred Grandy, Gopher, went on to become a congressman from Iowa. And I worked in Washington for a while, and he would get really mad because people would call him Gopher. So we were on the elevator with him one time. We walk off. My boss goes, Hey, that was Congressman Gopher. But since you talked about the Love Boat, when I was a kid, that was Saturday Night TV, and what came after the Love Boat was Fantasy Island. This was a show hosted by Ricardo Maltaban, he of the Corinthian Leather, and it was about this island. He was Mr. Rourke, and he had his little servant tattoo, who was played by Hervé Villachez. Now, wait a minute. I know Hervé Villachez was a kind of a donut connoisseur. Wasn't he? What was his yeah. favorite? Uh, Deplane, Deplane. There it is. We had to do it, and because we're contractually obligated to the universe to do that. But, but he would do Mr. Rourke. Would You'd come on, whatever your fantasy was. Would be he would grant for you, and it turned out I think the show ran for three seasons. He really had these unearthly powers because with one show he fought the devil, but then I don't know what happened to him. I think he went on to become a world dictator, get frozen, and menace people in the twenty third century in Starfleet. He didn't con you on the show though. Oh. That one hurt me. But he's that around a lot, too. But I guess, like, Leonard Nimoy said that when he did Wrath of Khan, I always thought those muscles were fake, but he was buff. I think wasn't uh, one of the theories about Fantasy Island was that he didn't battle the devil, but yet he he actually was the you devil? You never know. He had unearthly powers because there was something to him. And now I know there was a remake of it with Malcolm McDowell. I haven't even watched it. It didn't last long. So if you've seen it, see if it's any good. I have my... You could fantasize it's good, but I just don't think it would be. Well, there are some remakes of TV Kolchak, shows. Kolchak, terrible. Well, Kolchak, uh, unfortunately, The Prisoner, one we'll talk about in a later episode, was remade with the great Sir Ian McKellen. Wasn't it Sir Ian McKellen? It was Sir Ian, but it was terrible. And unfortunately, I love Sir Ian McKellen. He is fantastic in everything he does, but unfortunately, that one just, he could not save that, that show. But again, The Prisoner and other British-E type things, we'll discuss at a later date. What else did you never watch at the time but want to watch well, now? I actually discovered down the line Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And this was an Irwin Allen show. And Irwin Allen had that William Castle vibe. William Castle was a director who would always do theatrics. He would have like a skeleton run out. But Irwin Allen always started off a show 
It was really good, but then he would just go, he enjoyed cheese. And I would recommend sometime Lost in Space, if you ever watch The Great Vegetable Rebellion, or please don't watch it, even the cast will turn red when they hear this, but Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea was about the sea view, and it was Richard Basehart and David Hedison as the two officers on there, and it was based on a movie he did with Walter Pidgeon, and first it was really, really Cold War, this was like a highly advanced nuclear-powered sub, and what happened with it is they went on adventures, a lot of it was Cold War espionage, but then the Irwin Allen bug hit, and they started going after plant monsters, the ghost of maybe Moby Dick, there were lava men coming out of the Arctic Circle, but the one cool thing I liked about it, and you could find the model out there, they had the flying sub, and they had an episode with a werewolf rampaging, and the two had... Uh, cast members get away and they go fly off in the sub to get away from it. And they had a guy on there who was basically Scotty's engineer, he was chief engineer Sharky. And it's fun though, it became a fun show. But sometimes with Irwin Allen, you just go, Oh, come on, <laughs> I can't believe I have never watched that show. They have it on DVD, but again, now again with these old shows, they break it up into parts, and I don't think they have the full run yet. And the werewolf comes back, he was so popular. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to have to look at that one. No, because honestly, I there was a lot of shit. Like, I never watched Mission Impossible when I was younger. Uh, never it watched... wasn't impossible. It was in syndication. Like a vault. I never watched uh, Fantasy Island. I never really did. I... Well, a lot of Nickelodeon really brought a lot of these to me and probably for younger generations. Because back in the day, they might have repeats, but there weren't all these channels. So some of these were lost. Sometimes that wasn't a bad thing, but like you know, Star Trek went. Yeah, Nick at Night, and which I think now became TV Land. Yeah, that's where I discovered a lot of these shows. Car Fifty Four. Car Fifty Four. Uh, Get Smart, I think, was on there for a time. Uh, All in the Family. Yeah. Which and sadly, the problem was we would get these long marathons of it after the death of a cast member, and it was sadly after. Uh, Carol O'Connor passed away that I saw a very long marathon of All in the Family, which I'm going to throw it out there. I don't think really gets the recognition it deserves for what it did. They were tackling some pretty serious issues. TV got serious in the 1960s. That's what they said quality came to TV. So Yeah, because you're talking, I think there was the, the Rape of Edith Bunker yeah. episode. Plus, as goofy and racially insensitive as it seemed, it really did deal with race issues. Well, they had the balance. They had Archie, who was the comical bigot. Then they had the meathead, Michael Stivick, who was the liberal college student. And they did, so they actually had the, then they had Edith, who actually was a lot stronger than being the dingbat that Archie made her out to be. When she passed away, you saw what happened to Archie, how depressed he was. Yeah. But they mentioned talking, the thing is, you have to use comedy to draw people in. People don't like to talk about serious issues. Why? They're not fun. So you just make it humorous, and then after you do that, you can bring up some topics, and you can get a way that if they're taboo, you can have a way of handling it. And I think that's also a good way to shine the light on something that most people don't want to talk about, like like racism and rape and crime and all that, is to kind of put a, a silly spoof on it so people are like, oh, well, wait a minute, this actually exists. And I, I know a guy just like Archie Bunker, and... That guy's a dick. I think I grew up with a lot of those guys in my neighborhood. And what happened was they had the Jeffersons move in the neighborhood. And Sherman Helmsley was a black version of Archie Bunker in a lot of ways. But you would have Rollo playing the dumb stereotype to make Archie laugh and then just make it look like, oh, you have to be kidding because he's a very bright man. Yeah. Well, but I would be remiss if I didn't bring up one just because it's a favorite. This is the Phil Silvers show from the 1950s. Oh, uh, Phil and Silvers. And it's been called other names like you've never, you'll never be rich. And Phil Silvers, again, on Nickelodeon, they did this after he passed away. Phil Silvers is hilarious. And he played Sergeant Bilko. And it was basically a case of a scheming guy who ran the supply department and an army. And he had Joey Ross in there playing like another dog face type stupid guy who was just funny and lovable. And they would always try, he'd always try to do some scheme, always fail. But he had a good heart to him. Like he'd do something, he'd get the money that he donated if children and charity needed it. But it's just hilarious. And it really was. If you could find it, it's one of those gems. Because Phil Silvers, if you ever watch It's a Mad Man, Mad World, him and Jonathan Winters steal it, but he's all over the place. But now, he was a master there. Wasn't Phil Silver's the one who drove into the river and all, and the car sank, and all that was left was his hat yeah. floating on the water? And the old a, comedy trope, but it was hilarious. There's a remake of the show. It's a movie with Steve 
Steve Martin in the role, and I've never seen a Dan Aykroyd's in it, but might be good. Some of those are good. Sergeant Bilko? Yeah. It wasn't terrible. No, it wasn't bad. And I remember Glenn Headley, I think, was his love interest. And I know Dan Aykroyd was in it, but yeah, I've never Dan seen Dan Aykroyd it. played the bumbling uh, colonel. It, it was entertaining for what it was. It's mm-hmm. it's not one of those movies go out of your way to see, but if you catch it, it wasn't as bad. And the only thing I think we should do is because TV's called The Vast Wasteland is maybe recommend a book or two. So I was going to recommend, I read a book really interesting last week. It's by Arthur Thee Clark, who actually in the time... He's considered one of the great stuff. In the time, he was really a second-tier author. What happened, though, was Stanley Kubrick wanted to do a sci-fi movie, knew nothing about it. One of his friends loved Clark, so he recommended the story of the Sentinel, which is basically astronauts go to the moon and uh, find a monolith there, and it came from some planet. And Kubrick must have mixed it with a little LSD to do 2001. But at any, but at any rate, the book's called Astounding Stories, a science fictional autobiography. And what it is is Clark's love of the pulps. And these were the magazines like Astounding Tales, edited by people like Hugo Gerns back and John C. Campbell, who wrote the basis for the movie that became The Thing. And Ray Palmer was an editor. And what happened with him was he was the guy that was, think of the name, Ray Palmer. They based the atom on him. But what he did was he came up with the Men in Black hoax, even though Zach takes it seriously and plays one sometimes, like on the show today. He came up with this hoax about Men in Black visiting you if you saw UFOs, and they would say weird things so you wouldn't believe them. He made that up. People would write to him figuring he got abducted and they were making him say he made it up. But it's the history of the magazine, all the Frank Paul covers, which are gorgeous. But And it introduced a lot of a lot of science fiction, a lot of Robert Hyland stories were serialized, a lot of other ones. But one of the things is, okay, this was science fiction. Some of the stories could be a little odd. And there was one that stands out for Clark where the villain was a giant platypus. Now, I figure anything giant's going to be scary. And I think the males have a poison thing, but a platypus, I mean, come on. It's a, a giant little... platypus. Yeah, they have a, a barb on the back of their foot, but he goes them through the only the, toxic mammal in existence. He goes through existence. the history of them, and I don't think they're around no, anymore as much. I think Isaac Asimov had a magazine, and it ran for decades, and it really, the gold age of sci-fi started because all the authors would start serializing their stories in there, and a lot of them read these, and they were influenced, and Arthur T. Clarke used to write to the magazine all the time. He actually kept them, and he regrets it, because when we moved to Sri Lanka, if he had the early ones, they would have been worth a lot of cash. And there's a story, and I'll leave you with this on this topic, because I really like the book, so I'm going on about it. There's a story about 2001. If you look at the Who's album, Who's Next, they're relieving themselves on a monolith, or like a brick or something. The story goes that that's the who sort of giving the finger to Stanley Kubrick because they wanted him to direct Tommy, and that's they we wouldn't do it. So they were like, "That's what we think of 2001." Yeah, Stanley Kubrick showed them though. Yeah, but well, I want to correct myself. The platypus is not the only toxic mammal out there. The there is also the slow loris, who is slow but deadly. Looks like a little lemur, but stay away. And they hold umbrellas, and it's adorable. Um, well, actually, looking out the window, I see the and hear the. Uh, the broken muffler of the beast Dodge St. Regis coming into the driveway. So we're going to wrap it up before he comes in and starts demanding rent money, even though we don't actually live here. Uh, good news, because also last week we mentioned we actually have a real sponsor now. So I'm going to give another shout out to them. Upsitnik and Associates, attorneys for 40 years fighting for you, the people, from the Supreme Court to Alaska and all points in between. That last name is O.P., S-I-T-N-I-C-K. Find them on Facebook. We're going to put all this stuff in all the descriptions on our stuff. And uh, one last thing. I want to give a warm shout-out to our good buddy Tinker Dill over in the U.K., perusing the landscape, making sure that we have the absolute finest of antiquities. And Internet, if you catch that reference, let us know. We'll give you a shout-out. We'll give you some dill pickles. Oh, God. Well, and on that terrible... Salty joke, I guess. We're going to wrap it up here. Join us next week for another really, really weird whatever we're going to do. And, uh, well, that'd be that. And you say goodbye. I say hello. Goodbye.